Hello, and welcome back to Avon Talks. Today, I'm joined by Jay Willerup of the Hublin Tower. How are you doing today, Jay? I'm well, thanks. Thanks for having me. This is contextually probably the latest we've ever recorded one of these episodes. This <laughs> is um, being recorded at 10.30 as we're speaking <laughs> right now, which is completely my fault since my bus no back to Avon Not was uh, delayed <laughs> substantially. But thank you, thank you for being so understanding about this. My pleasure. So to get started into this topic of the Hublin Tower, could you quickly tell us what is the Hublin Tower very briefly for those who maybe aren't super familiar with it? Yeah, the Hublin Tower, well, and you have called it Hublin Tower. Mm-hmm. Well, there's Hublin Tower as well. It's all one of the same. Hublin is actually the family name, and... Uh, they wanted to differentiate themselves from the company, so they developed a marketing scheme mm-hmm. to change, kind of change their name to Hubline. Mm-hmm. So however you say it, it's right, but actually the correct Bavarian pronunciation is Hoibline. But anyway, the, the uh, history of the tower starts back in uh, early 1800s. Uh, there were a couple other towers that were up on the, um, up on the ridge. Mm-hmm. One is by Daniel Wadsworth of Wadsworth Athenaeum, and it was um, in 1911 when uh, Gilbert Heimlein and his wife, Louise, were up there. And he said to her, I'm going to build you a castle here someday. Mm-hmm. So he started then. And 1914, it had opened as a summer residence. Mm-hmm. They lived in Hartford. So they would commute up to the tower. And actually, even before that, there were, there were some of the other towers. And Mark Twain and Joseph Twitchell, who was the minister at Salem Hill Congregational Church would walk from Twain's house mm-hmm. up to the ridge and uh, and then walk back usually every other Sunday. So there's a little bit of history up there. So you say it started just as a summer residence, but then the tower throughout its history, it had a lot of different uses. It had a lot of different purposes, like the evolution of the tower from a summer residence as it was first constructed into the state park that it is now. Could you tell me a little bit about that story? Sure. The, the high blinds, you know, started started there in uh, early 1900s. And it was, again, just a weekend, weekend house. There was a care- caretaker that lived up there and his, his family. When Gilbert died and Louise died, their grandson sold it and they sold it to, he sold it to the Hartford Times. Mm-hmm. And as I grew up, in that era, I knew it as the Times Tower. Mm-hmm. And so the uh, Harvard Times used it as, as a um, entertainment venue. Mm-hmm. And they sold it in the early 60s to a couple, uh, actually I think three investors. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to turn the tower into a restaurant and build luxury homes and condominiums up there. And people both sides of the ridge, you know, Avon, Simsbury, and Bloomfield, and West Hartford to a lesser extent you know, really wanted to keep that as a pristine part mm-hmm. of the mountain. So they rallied together and got the state involved to purchase it and turn it into the park that it is today. Mm-hmm. And sorry, just quickly circling back, what was it that the Hublin family did? Like, why were they able to build this tower in the first place? They were one of the wealthiest families in Hartford. Actually, it was Gilbert's father who came from, from Bavaria and landed in um, New Haven and uh, started a restaurant there, and br- then brought it up to Hartford, bought a hotel, and then started dabbling in liquors and wine and beers and things like that. Mm-hmm. And that's where, where it really kind of took off there. And they, so they really kind of got into importing and exporting beers and wines and, and liquors. And wasn't one of these, one of the reasons why their beer and wine and liquor industry, like why it did so well was because they were sort of innovators in their field, at least during this period? Yes, actually they were, um, had really just taken off. They were very successful. But some of the things that they did were just kind of happenstance. I think they they were, they were supposed to have a um, a company come and do an event, mm-hmm. and one of the things that they did was for the people that were walking in, they would pre mix cocktails, mm-hmm. so that when you walk in, you really didn't have to ask for a gin and tonic or whatever. They they would have them ready. They would just have the ice to it, and uh, but unfortunately, this particular event, I don't know if it rained or snowed or or, or what, and mm-hmm. they had to postpone it a day. And one of the people said, well, what are we going to do with all this pre-mixed cocktails? So they took the ice out and put them in the, in the ice box. Mm-hmm. 
and used to the next day. I and mean, that was really the beginning of pre-mix cocktails. Mm-hmm. And so things like that, they were very successful at, you know, just making the best of, uh, of any kind of a situation. Moving more into present day, sorry, when, what, what was the date exactly when the Hublin Tower or the High Blind Tower became a state park officially? Uh, I think 1963, if memory serves me correct. So how is that, how is that history or that process of first becoming a state park and then becoming as well recognized of an icon as it is today? What was that process like? It was purchased, I, I think it was for $600,000 mm-hmm. at that point. And, um, you know, there's just over the years, I mean, it was a big chunk of land, and it was an old building. Um, the state has actually taken a couple of buildings down because mm-hmm. they, were, they were run down. And then they really worked hard to set up a program to restore. And restoring back in the late 60s was very different than restoring today Mm -hmm. you know there's much more depth and that's one of the things we do Mm -hmm. we help try to augment the state and say you know here's what our research is you know for some of the original pictures and some of the hearsays of how the building was originally originally designed originally intact so it's also there's the hublin tower and then there's talcott mountain are those one and the same or are those two separate entities really kind of one and the same because you know high blind tower is in talcott mountain Mm -hmm. state park and John Talcott was a, uh, a general or a colonel in the Army, and, and mm-hmm. he was well-renowned. He was some well-known yeah, officer. Yeah, and that's why there's the name Talcott Mountain. Mm-hmm. And then was it, like, just a natural thing? Are you guys, like, as the board of the Hublin Tower, do you guys are you guys sort of in charge of Talcott Mountain State Park as well, or is that separate? Not really. The State uh, Department of, of Energy and Environmental Protection, they were oh, the I ones that, that do all the maintenance. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were the ones, we are the ones that really kind of help augment, you know, through research, you know, mm-hmm. whenever there's a, a lamp that gets broken or things that fall apart, we mm-hmm. try to get it back to the original style mm-hmm. as best as we can, again, through pictures and hearsay. So aside from the story of simply how the tower was built and the, the different hands that it went through in order to become a state park today, there's also a lot of surprisingly miscellaneous history associated with the tower. For example, we have apparently some presidential history with it. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, there's actually uh, two presidents that have been up there in various roles. The first one is uh, back in the 50s, Prescott Bush, who lived in New Haven, you know, asked this the gentleman who was the president of Columbia University up to the tower and um, sat him in the chair, and we, we actually have that, that chair mm-hmm. in the living room, and asked him to run for president, and that was Dwight Eisenhower. Mm-hmm. And then the second one was not during his presidency, but Ronald Reagan was up there. He was president of the Screen Actors Guild at that point. So those are probably the Wait, two What was Ronald Reagan doing up in Hewlett Tower? <laughs> um, probably a function through the Hartford Times. or excuse, uh, Yeah, Hartford Times. When you say it was like, a well-known icon within that day because i'm assuming he wouldn't just host these venues anywhere these are pretty significant events in any in any context so would you say that during that day the tower had a lot of influence or was fairly well known amongst the northeast as like yes i I think so and that um certainly through the hypeline family um one of the things they did was you had to sign in to the uh you know when a guest boat you know, so you, we have that, and mm-hmm. we you can see all the important people that would come up there for parties. And don't forget, you know, Gilbert had access to the finest food and the mm-hmm. finest booze, so the parties were pretty legendary. So this was like a pretty upscale thing. Oh, very yeah. much so. You know, you could see how how the people lived. You know, the well well to do people lived in that day. Is any of that still present in the tower? Like, can people still see it? Or we have some pictures, but I mean, you can see that. The, the tower has been added on to by the high blinds mm-hmm. uh, once in 21 and once in 28. And they were just made it, they just realized how much they loved it up there and wanted more people to go up there. Um, so they expanded it, you know, space for their maids and drivers and, you know, chefs and all kinds of other people, mm-hmm. you know, that would go up there. Mm-hmm. Have there been any other notable people up there then, aside from or these two? I'm thinking about it now. These aren't even like run-of-the-mill presidents. These are like pretty iconic 
political figures in yep. U.S. history. Have there? Any, I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming there definitely have been other notable Americans, but do you know of any yourself or like um, off the top of your head? The ones that we have documentation of, uh, Admiral Nimitz, mm. Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank um, Lloyd Wright was up there? Yep. yep. Wow. Uh, Tallulah Bankhead. Uh-huh. Uh, those are the ones I was that come also to... up there once. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so was I. <laughs> I'm not that notable. <laughs> I didn't even find that when I was researching the tower for this this episode. That's really fascinating. Yeah, uh, very interesting. Yeah, very 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 diverse. Frank Lloyd Wright and Ronald Reagan in one place. That's not. Yep. That's nothing. I. That's I yeah. never imagined that would be something uh, that I heard. We agree. <laughs> <laughs> but that. That really does add to, like, the mystique of this tower. This is, like, this history has fallen so underneath the radar throughout the years. So oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, we have um, we have records that, that uh, we keep of the amount of people that sign into the building. Mm-hmm. And it's only, well, obviously, when the building is open. And 2019, so that was the year before COVID, mm-hmm. um, we had people from all 50 states and 48 countries. Mm-hmm. And we estimate that there's probably a, typically is now a quarter million people that go through the park in a year. Mm-hmm. That's pretty significant. Do you guys still get any notable people coming up to the park every now and then, or has it sort of drifted off? Um, mostly uh, local people, mm-hmm. you know, usually um, governors, mm. legislators, yeah. you know, sometimes big um, high powered people that mm-hmm. own businesses, but. It's it's a little different today. And so sort of pivoting away from the history of the Hublin Tower, I was wondering a little bit about how you personally got involved within the tower and its mm. organization. I don't think we actually mentioned this on the podcast yet, but Jay Willerup, who's joining us today, is the current president of the board of the Hublin Tower. Correct. So how did you get involved with this? And like, I guess a follow-up to that, or in addition to that, is what what was it about the tower that really stood out to you and made you want to take up so much responsibility uh, involving its maintenance and upkeep and resurgence? Uh, Just kind of in a a weird way, um, you know, we've always had the tower in our back door, Mm -hmm. you know, growing up in Avon, living in Simsbury. It's just, it's just so prominent. So we're, I'd I'd go up there with my wife and young kids. And one day I saw the sign in book. So I I signed in and I Mm -hmm. said, that I was an architect and I do a lot of restoration work. And I said, if you need any, any help, mm-hmm. I'd love to, to help you if I can. Mm-hmm. Well, later that week, the then president called me and we had probably <laughs> a, a, an hour long conversation. Uh-huh. And, um, and it was, it's odd in that actually my dad was a businessman, but he played a mean piano. And I didn't know this at, at the time because he died when I was young. Mm-hmm. He used to get invited to go up to the Times Tower, mm-hmm. as it was known in the Harvard Times era, play for parties up there. So he was involved in it. So anyway, I, I, I did join the board, and uh, one of the presidents had left, and the president and the rest of the board said, Jay should be it. Mm-hmm. You know, she, you should be co-president. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of responsibility. So I've been that for maybe eight, ten years or so. Mm-hmm. So. So then two follow-ups to that. If your father had actually played, like, while it was still the Times Tower, that means that he probably played for some pretty heavy guests. Yes. I'm assuming. He played for some pretty heavy crowds. Do you know of any stories of this, or has it sort of... No, unfortunately, he died when I was 11, so I never really got to to talk to him or ask him about that. Yeah. And my mother, you know, she knew that he was up there playing, but, uh, Mm -hmm. but didn't know any of the people up there. And I guess the second part is... Being able to be nominated as pretty much almost like for sure um, Jay Willerup should be the next co-president. That's got to be that. That's I feel like that's a real indication of how much work you've put into the tower. I'm not, I'm not trying to get you to brag about <laughs> the work that you've done for the tower, but like maybe you could elaborate a little bit on like the sorts of things that really made them think that you should be the next co-president? Well, one of the things that we do is is the board up there is that we want to restore things. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of research that has to happen before you even think about what you're trying to research and how you're going to do it and who's going to do it. So, um, you know, as an architect, having a lot of historical background, I was able to do that. Mm-hmm. And um, so it just kind of really seemed a natural fit. Mm-hmm. 
you know, I've never, not really ever done anything civically mm-hmm. like that before. But uh, it was just, you know, I felt closer to my family, you know, mm-hmm. again, being in the backyard. Um, it was just, it was, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. I've actually, you know, one of the things that we do is, is actually keep a timesheet. Mm-hmm. So that we know as a board how many hours we put in, mm-hmm. and it's it's staggering. Typically, I think the last couple of years that I I tallied it, it was it equaled two people for the entire year, mm-hmm. full time. Mm-hmm. That was all of our time that we put in. Um, you know, that's that's a lot of hours, a lot of free hours. Yeah, and it's you all know, volunteer work as well. Yeah, all yeah. volunteer. And away from our families, mm-hmm. you know, we always kind of joke about, oh, this is our second home, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> kind of is. <laughs> yeah. So what, what would you say, like, the rest of the volunteers at the tower, like, um, like, what what do you think the driving motivation behind this is and, like, why people continue to do this kind of volunteer work? I think that, I think a lot of people that live in, um, in the valley mm-hmm. and even on the other side of the ridge, you know, West Hartford and Bluefield. You know, there's a. This is theirs. This mm-hmm. not. It's not ours. It's not the state's. It's theirs. Uh, we just uh, reinstalled the the beacon that was up there that mm-hmm. was out for nearly ten years, mm-hmm. and everybody said, "Oh, it's alive again." It's you know, now I know my way home because I mm-hmm. see the beacon, mm-hmm. and they do the same thing with the with the tower. You mm-hmm. know, when it's light out, you know, this is this is theirs. You know, and they they take ownership in it. So I think when they have the opportunity to either join the board or come and volunteer for some of our events, mm-hmm. they they're very passionate about it. It's theirs. Wait, sorry, just to clarify, what was what is the beacon that you're talking about? Is it up in up in the very t- very top, the mm-hmm. cupola? Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a beacon, and as far as we can, as far as our research shows, mm-hmm. it goes back to 19, 1965. Would be um, mm-hmm. the end of the Harford Times era, yeah. and. Um, it had gone out, and uh, none of the state workers wanted to replace the the light bulb that was in there. Mm-hmm. It's up, up 165 feet in the air, mm-hmm. and you had to climb up all the way to the observation level mm-hmm. and then up to, like, three ladders and before you get to the outside. And uh, so I, I did it just mm-hmm. because I'm a little foolish <laughs> and, uh, and very brave, I guess, or very stupid. And so I went up there this one time with a bulb, which is, like, about 12 inches long, about uh-huh. four inches in diameter, and uh, swung the, the globe away, and I didn't realize that the globe was actually full of water. Okay. So here I am, 165 feet in the air, uh-huh. um, playing with electricity and water, which is not, not very bright. Mm-hmm. And I quickly closed the light fixture up, and I said to the board at the, our next meeting, we're not doing that again. <laughs> and what we're going to do is we're going to um, have an LED uh-huh. light fixture, and we'll use take the old one off mm-hmm. and and display that, which is what we've done. So mm-hmm. back in May twentieth, uh, May twentieth of this year, mm-hmm. we flip. We're actually able to flip the switch and get the get it glowing again. Okay. Wait. So when you went up to replace the bulb, that wasn't the official like replacing the. No, it was it's not my job description. Is okay. that what you're saying? <laughs> no, not, not at all. No one wanted to do it. Everybody was afraid to do it. And so I feel like this is this is sort of like a stating the obvious, but the tower is very involved within the community. I feel like the tower and the community it's so involved to the point that you can't really separate the two. I guess. Um, what I'm trying to get at with this question is what are some of the more specific events that you guys have held to engage with the community aside from your day to day, which is, you know, a lot of people coming up Talcott Mountain and like looking at the tower every day? Yeah, typically um, we do two major events in e- each year. One is I mean, we just celebrated the ninth uh, hike to the bike, and that's a, an event where it's all weekend and we have bands playing there, mm-hmm. regional bl- bands that are. T- trying to get some notoriety. Mm-hmm. And we have a little stage that we set up in the uh, croquet court, which is just south of, of the tower. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's just live music, you know, all day long. Mm-hmm. And if you don't like this particular band, you know, wait wait <laughs> a, an hour. The uh-huh. next one's coming in. Uh-huh. Uh, so that's that's been a big fundraiser. Most of these are, are fundraisers mm-hmm. so that we can do um, additional re- restoration projects. And then the other one, which we just did uh, this past weekend, 
is the Tower Toot, and that's mm-hmm. where we coordinate that with, it's usually the third weekend in October, mm-hmm. and it's peak leaf peeping time, mm-hmm. and um, it's a fun family and friends event. We flip burgers and dogs and bratwurst and have hot cider, cold cider, things like that, and it's, uh, again, it's, it's a fundraiser for us. Mm-hmm. And what to use a colloquial word, what do you think the vibe is here, like the the atmosphere? I think it's we're we're back post COVID. Mm-hmm. You know, we used to get a lot of people up there, mm-hmm. and then during COVID, <clears throat> we never were, were able to keep a record of how many people were up there. But but I used to drive by, or people would drive by, and and, and would see the parking lot full. Mm-hmm. And then say, what's going on up at the tower? You know, you're the president. You should know. Like, <laughs> I think people just wanted to get out. Uh-huh. And I, so I'm very thankful that we have the state park, mm-hmm. you know, that the people were able to get out and exercise and get some fresh air. They weren't cooped up in their house, not mm-hmm. in their office. I think we were very lucky to have that. And I feel like just as a cultural icon, like I feel like the Cuban Tower is sort of just seen at this point as a cultural icon of the Farmington Valley and even by an extension of that of Connecticut um and I feel like it's it's really been ingrained within like the identities of people who live around here for example when I'm driving like home from wherever and I see the Hublin Tower it's it's like a very clear part of an otherwise fairly in this like indistinguishable skyline like it's a very clear landmark here and i was wondering how much of that do you feel like there is with running this tower or like being in charge of it and like managing the day-to-day how much of it can you glimpse like just f- oh it's 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 prevalent mm-hmm. i mean it's just it's so important i mean even our our two oldest kids um when they would drive down nod road and see the light blinking, and they they would say to me, "Oh, well, that's that's how Rudolph knows where our house is." Mm-hmm. So, like you, you know, you know when you're home. Yeah, everybody says that. You know, mm-hmm. if they're coming in from skiing up north, coming in from the beach, coming from wherever, they see the either the tower or the blinking light. Mm-hmm. They know they're close to home. Yeah, that's pretty pretty important. It's pretty powerful. Yeah, no, it's definitely it is definitely a symbol of yeah. being at home, as you say, and. Yeah, I mean it's 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 very much Avon and like Farmington Valley, and honestly, I think it is probably the most notable landmark like within this area. I'm trying I to think, think probably off the top within of my Connecticut. Head. I mean, yeah. it, it's so visible. I mean, you know, you you go up up there up in the observation level, which was the old board uh, ballroom. Excuse mm-hmm. me, you could see out to Mount Tom, which is out in Kent. Mm-hmm. You know, close to the New York line, you can see up to Mount Tom in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can almost almost see to the um, um, Long Island Sound, but you can see Sleeping Giant, which is down in Hamden. That's a big spread of land. You know, it's most of Connecticut, really. And so as part of this identity, I wonder how much... So obviously, as someone who's, like, lived here, as, as two people who have, like, lived in Avon and in the Farmington Valley for a pretty long time, we see this tower and we identify with it, but... What is it like then for people who are just moving here? How do, have you guys sort of tried to share this tower with them to kind of keep its legacy going um, moving forward? Well, typically we just, you know, encourage them to take the hike. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's a little bit tough in the beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a little steep. Mm-hmm. But when you once you hit the ridge, it's just going horizontal mm-hmm. until you hit the tower. And then, you know, you're in a little magical place. One of the people... Um, we were doing something one day, and um, probably the Tower Toot, and this woman was coming from MDC mm-hmm. Reservoir in West Hartford, and she said, I just wanted to have a quiet little hike mm-hmm. and have some quiet time. Uh-huh. And she goes, I'm walking through the woods, and there's this big party going on. Uh-huh. <laughs> and she goes, it was just so magical up mm-hmm. there, and it really is. Yeah, I mean— I've been up to the tower a few times when I just moved here and we've gone to some of these events. And I feel like that is probably one of the places in Avon where the community is the most noticeable. It's, it's, there's a real sense of community when you're up there. Yeah, we've, we've had people that have come up and one time I was coming out of the building and, and uh, just you know being as a friendly person, I'd say, you know, hello, how are you, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. 
and this person, you know, was was really excited. And I said, is, is, is this your first time up here? And he goes, no, we come up here every year. Mm-hmm. I think it was for the Tower too. And he said, it's a race with my family to see what you've done. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what are your changes? What are your updates? What are your restoration projects? Mm-hmm. That made me feel really good that mm-hmm. what we're doing is, is making a difference. I feel like the, at least for me, when I just moved here, one of the first things that we did was like look around at things to do in Avon and like places to go hiking and the Hublin Tower and Talcott Mountain just stood out instantly. Um, and then once we got to the top, I think the first thing that we did once we got to the top was try to like spot our own house <laughs> from the top <laughs> no of the doubt. tower, yeah, which no I'm doubt. assuming you get a lot up there. Yeah, <laughs> you get yeah. a lot of people trying to spot different areas yeah. in Avon. It definitely does just feel like one of these centerpieces and at least to the volunteers, which I didn't even realize it was all volunteer work. I legitimately thought that like as iconic of a building as like the Hublin Tower, it would have definitely been run by like a huge team of like, you know, dedicated like full time workers. And so just the idea that it's all volunteer work and it's all people who were really just enamored with the beauty of the tower and the community that it drew that they dedicated so much time to this, I think that sort of adds to the history and makes the tower even more special. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't certainly want to, you know, we're not the only ones that are up there. Mm-hmm. There's the uh, staff there from Penwood State Forest. Okay. You know, they do all the maintenance up there mm-hmm. and, and take care of it, you know, clean it, open it up, you mm-hmm. know, where we just are pretty much just do special restoration mm-hmm. projects. And fundraisers to, you know, fund those restoration projects. Mm-hmm. So we're not the only people out there by any means. So we're nearing the end of this recording. I was wondering, are there any uh, upcoming plans for the tower moving forward that you can see thus far that you'd like to share? Sure. A couple of things that actually one we have coming up um, maybe 15 years ago, we were walking around the, uh, the site and with my former co-president, and we found this big, um, what she thought was a boiler, but it's actually actually happened to be a water cistern that you you just keep water in. So I'm looking at it, and I'm standing, I ended up looking at my feet, and I'm like standing on this big fat pipe, maybe nine, ten inches in diameter. Mm-hmm. And um, Catherine said, oh, that must be, you know, some of the piping for the, the building. And I said, you know, as an architect, that's just way too big, you know. Anyway, so um, I started clearing the leaves off it, and maybe about another 15 feet away, it got a little smaller. And another 15 feet away, it got a little smaller, so on and so forth. And I didn't realize I was standing on the original flagpole that was up there, oh. and that's 85 feet tall. Uh-huh. So we, one of the things we hope to do this spring is to restore that and put that back up. So those are some of the things we do. And actually, uh, the observation level has not the original windows in it anymore. So Mm -hmm. uh, the state is actually taking care of that and um, going to a newer, um, uh, a better window, more insulated, um, because otherwise the the air is leaking through there Mm -hmm. horribly. And one of the things I think we want to do as the the friends uh, would really like to restore the uh, foyer Mm-hmm. It was originally oak paneled. We have some of it uh, that's up in the garage that we'd like to reuse. Nothing better than reusing what was there. Mm-hmm. So we'd like to try maybe do that one as mm-hmm. a future project. And I guess big picture, what do you see the future of the tower being within the Farmington Valley? Aside from the uh, the renovations that you guys are doing, what do you what do you hope that the tower's legacy will be, I guess, moving forward? I think just, you know, the people can get up there. and It, it kind of bugs me in that, um, you know, living here in the valleys for so long mm-hmm. and people say, oh, you know, I'm, I hear you're on, on the, the board. And I said, yes. And, you know, like I've lived here all my life and I've never been there. Mm-hmm. And I want to get that out there. I want people to be there. You know, it's, it's a hiking only park, but there are ways that we can get up there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there hand, there's no handicap access, mm-hmm. and that's not going to change. The building is not handicap, mm-hmm. but I think if we can do that in other ways through cameras. Um, you know, we can have ca- cameras and people can see what's going on up there. 
we'd love to have a series of cameras up in the cupola so mm -hmm. that if someone wants to see the sunrise or sunset or the weather come in, mm -hmm. all they have to do is, you know, dial it up. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a great legacy. This podcast is an Avon Historical Society production, edited by me, Ethan Guo. Special thanks to Priscilla Marshall for the graphics. If you'd like to support this podcast, please subscribe and leave a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever else podcasts are downloaded. Want to be featured on a future episode or stay up to date with the podcast newsletter? Feel free to reach out to us at avontalksahs at gmail.com. For more on the Avon Historical Society, visit www.avonhistoricalsociety.org. Thank you.